welcome to another InventRight TV show. My name is Andrew Krauss. I co-founded InventRight 21 years ago with Stephen Key, and we've been coaching and mentoring inventors to successfully license their products ever since we've had students in over 65 countries. And we'd like to have guests on, and today we have patent attorney Jake Ward. Jake, welcome back. Hello, Andrew. Thanks for having me. You're becoming a regular, man. Oh, yeah. I yeah, enjoy doing <laughs> So this was kind of a weird question that, that I've been dealing with for a long time, and I wanted to run it by you. We've, I mentioned we've had students in over 65 countries, right? And yes. so we have students in other countries, we have students here, and you know they have thoughts about licensing their product around the world. I mean, quite often, they're gonna license to a US company or European company. Maybe that European company is big in the US, but it's, it's pretty rare, I'll just say it up front, that you're going to license it in 20 different countries to 20 different companies. That's pretty rare. But people have the thought and they want to have the potential to do that. And it does, you always, every inventor has that potential. So they always say, well, Andrew, is there an international provisional patent application? And I always say no. But I say the, the U.S. is part of what's called the PCT, the Patent Cooperation Treaty. And correct me on any of this if I'm off at all. Um, they're part of the PCT, the U.S., and so is many other countries. Most European countries, Australia, tons of other countries are part of the Patent Cooperation Treaty. So if you file a provisional patent application, you know, you can later file what's called a PCT application. And in a way, with caveats, which I don't know if you can even go all into all of them. Um, we'll talk about it. Yeah. It, it's a, it's, it can be a little bit of a de facto international provisional patent application because it later lets you file the PCT application which gives you 18 months and then file internationally which that gets a little expensive really expensive correct, correct. Um, so and can you talk about the practicality all of that and maybe just some of the yeah. caveats and we could have a disclaimer going okay there's so many countries <laughs> they always these weird little exceptions you know Re remember yeah remember the the axiom the good the good lawyer advice is it depends right <laughs> so so we'll say that we'll say that up front it does depend on on the facts of your particular situation but right. but i think you've brought up a number of really good meaty issues that we can we can sort of dive into one is you know is there an international provisional application and and the answer is no you know there there is no treaty that actually covers an international provisional application not at at least not what um, as what we understand generally a provisional or a PPA provisional patent application is in the United States. That being said, uh, because we have this nice provisional process in, in the United States for lodging your invention informally with the patent office, by virtue of other treaties, um, and in fact the one that comes to mind is the Paris Convention Treaty, um, you do have the ability within one year of the filing of your provisional application in the United States to file corresponding foreign applications, including an international application um, under the PCT treaty, which we'll talk about in the moment. Mm -hmm. So remember, filing the provisional application in the United States preserves the right underneath international treaty to make foreign filings as long as you file within one year and claim the benefit of that provisional filing date one year earlier. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's why we you would said it's sort of the, a de facto international provisional. Um, that's, that's the reason why that occurs. And that's um, in, in all you know practicality, that is what companies and entrepreneurs will do very often. So they'll file that initial provisional at the end of the year. Then they have a decision to make, and that decision is: Do I want to start examination not only in the U.S. but kick off the process internationally? And now you can, at that point, you can file direct file in individual countries. And sometimes we advise that you know if if maybe you know your market is just North America. Um, or just the United States and Canada. Well, maybe you file the provisional at the end of the year. Not only do you file your U.S. application, non-provisional, to start examination, but you might do a direct filing into Canada to start the examination process there. So you don't um, you don't always have to file the PCT that 18 month application. That's just you, if you, you know that need another 18 months. Exactly, exactly. But the, that brings up a good point because of this other international treaty, the PCT Patent Cooperation Treaty. At the end of the year, you could instead opt to file that international application. And like you said, it's it basically buys an additional 18 months, year and how, a half. How much is that? How much is, it, how much is the fee and what does it cost with an attorney to file a PCT? Because that gets fairly expensive and then international patents get really yeah. expensive. Yeah, for for a, a, a micro entity, um, which is what uh, we generally refer to during these calls, because you mentioned provisional applications are about $75 
in government fees. For a micro entity, it's going to be about you know two thousand uh, dollars, twenty five hundred dollars. It depends a little bit on the number of pages. For the provisional patent or the PCT? For the PCT application right. at the end of the year. Um, because what you're doing is, and, and the majority of that is government fees, even if you're working with a patent attorney. Um, and what you're doing is you are buying that additional year and a half to decide which countries do I really want to file in. And as part of those fees, you know, those government fees you pay for a PCT, you, you do have certain services that you're paying for. You get what's called a, an international search report and a written opinion, which will give you some insight into the likelihood of success when you ultimately get to the, the stage where you can file directly into those foreign countries and start examination. Now, I got but a weird is, question for expensive. you. I got yeah, a really okay. weird question for you. Brought up this thought. I think I've had this thought before. So we always talk about, and we did some prior shows with you where we talk about this. You, you can't extend a provisional. It's a year. If you want to file it again, you haven't made public disclosure, you can do that. You get the new date. You don't get to continue the old date and connect them together. Okay. But, and I'm getting creative here. And since you're a patent attorney, it's a good time to ask these fun questions. If you Bring filed it. a provisional yeah. patent, could you file a PCT to get another 18 months and then file in the U.S.? If you're a U.S. citizen, is that a way of extending a provisional patent in 18 months? And again, the it's a really weird answer, question. Is, I know it, it depends. But what it, what it would depend on would be how thorough of a provisional application you had filed. Hmm. And I will tell you, the majority of provisionals probably aren't thorough enough to just convert them into an international PCT application at that point. Um, you know, you're probably going to have to put some additional work into, you know, uh, making a nice formal document that can then be moved forward. Because nice thing about provisionals, um, they're intended to be informal, and it's a sort of expected that you'll be making changes and improvements over the year. And when you get to the regular non-provisional stage at the end, that's when work goes into it. You get a full set of claims, nice formal drawings made by patent artists and all that. That actually is what you need to file the PCT application. Because mm. once the PCT application is filed, you're not going to have the ability to make any of those those changes and and, and, and to comply with formalities. Right. Um, it's an awfully expensive answer, way to try to extend it's an a oddly, provision. I was going to say, as a strategy, if you have a couple thousand dollars sitting around, <laughs> you know, you, you could say, I, I could do that. My advice would be, um, again, if you if your application is at how I expect it would be for a provisional, which would be rather informal, um, you know it's probably not likely you're going to be able to use that strategy without incurring additional costs. And if you're going to be yeah. incurring those additional costs to create the formal the formal PCT application, you might as well just be filing your U.S. application at the same time. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, because it's it's because the cost if the cost was really low, it might make sense. That, um, that's right. But but um, I think it raises a good point. You mentioned the number of countries. I think last I heard it's either 153 or 154 wow. countries are party to the PCT treaty. Wow. Um, and that includes the United States. So you don't actually have to um, kick off examination in the United States immediately at the end of the year by, by filing your regular U.S. application. You could just file an international and then eight and wait another 18 months and then the U.S. is just one of those countries that you ultimately mm -hmm. drop the application into for examination. The technical term for that is called national stage or national phase oh, okay. in, in, in individual countries. Hey, getting back to my earlier silly question, instead <laughs> of trying to extend the provisional, if you haven't made public disclosure, you just showed it to some companies. Most of our students, they just file another $75 provisional. Yes, they lose the time in between the original one and the new one. If somebody else could have come up with something in that period, but we've never had that happen to one of our students where somebody else came it up. It was, sure. but it could, it could, but there's yeah. a difference between it could or possibly, or you could get struck by lightning and it actually happening, but you know, it could. So you have to give that disclaimer. And we, and we talked about this in, in earlier interviews, right? That, that there is just an inherent risk. You know, it's a business risk that all inventors take, even when you file the application initially, because there is a blackout period of 18 months, you don't know what anybody else has filed in the prior 18 months prior to you making your filing because those filings remain secret for that period of time. When you file uh, a full utility patent. When you file even a provisional application. You know, well, it's always filed, secret. Nobody can ever see it, correct? Well, what I was what I was saying is if you file your own provisional application today, you don't know what other people have filed right. for the past eight months. So there's a, oh, there's always this business risk. It's, a, it's an inherent risk. 
Um, and I think to your point, um, it's rare. It's rare that, that this will become an issue. I think we as patent attorneys do a really good job of, of advising people and almost to the point that some inventors get a little scared about, about should, I, should I be filing this or not? And, well, um, as an attorney, but, you have to go, you have to talk worst case scenario, right? And sometimes, sometimes. Well, you have to say, well, this or this could yeah. happen, you know? And, but, and, and maybe sometimes you don't want to say, oh, it's extremely rare because you, you, you got to tell them what could happen. Yeah, I, guess. I, I think the I think the important part, you know, you know, to sort of wrap wrap up this conversation here, the important sort of part I would emphasize is there's an inherent risk associated with any filing, you know, because there is a period of time uh, where where applications remain secret, and with international applications, since we're talking about those, those international applications, those will generally publish about six months after your your provisional application would would have normally expired remember because it's it's 12 months with the provisional oh yeah that's interesting plus, yeah plus yeah. six months with the international so there's even a six month blackout period where no one's going to be able to find your international application unless you, unless yeah, you what, share it. what he's referring to guys and from my own understanding too when you file a utility patent 18 months after you file it it goes public on what you filed the patent office they haven't done office action they have granted anything so you're like this is what i'm trying to get after 18 months but when you file a PCT, what you're saying is you've already got the year from the provisional, and now you only get another six months, and now that's going to go public six months Correct. after you file the PCT. Correct, because so. because that 18 months is measured from the earliest filing date. And if two documents are linked together like a chain, like a like a, P, a provisional and a later filed PCT are, right. then it's measured from the provisional's filing date. Yeah. And, and in case some of you are like... My, my head's going to explode. <laughs> Most of this stuff, you, you don't even need to worry about the PCT and all these other things. It's, it's rare that our students have to worry about them. But it's, I like that we're covering some more advanced stuff I, on our show. I, uh, I would say just in general, too, and you and I have talked about this in previous conversations, Andrew. Some of the advice I give to clients uh, um, when they come to me and they ask, Jake, should I make foreign filings? You know, I think it's, it's a business decision. There's no legal requirement ever, by the way, to file any patent application. Um, but I oftentimes will advise clients to think critically about where's your market. You know, don't necessarily think about where I'm going to be making this product, uh, but where am I going to be selling this? Because that's ultimately the value in the patent is you're going to be able to fence off whatever countries that you have the patent in and prevent people from making, using, or selling an infringing product or a copycat product in those countries. So if 99% of your market you expect, for at least for the foreseeable future, is going to be the United States. Well, do you necessarily want to incur the expenses of making all sorts of foreign filings? Because, th and this is an important point, patents are territorial. They're only good in the countries where right. you have them. And, you, and every country has its own laws that you're going to have to fight through in order to get the patent. So cost-wise, you know, although every country is different, you know, but if you need a general rule of thumb, if you go into 10 foreign countries, you might expect... 10 times the cost of what it would be to obtain the patent in the U.S. Because you're having to make that good fight in every single one Even of Even big countries. companies don't like to spend that much money on. No. But here, no. so getting back to the original question is, is there an international PPA? And Jake clearly said there isn't. Mm. But a U.S. provisional patent, because they're part of these other treaties, you can kind of utilize it that way. And especially with the invent right approach, because we're all about ideally filing the provisional patent like the week or the day before you're ready to call potential license. You got a whole year to both get to have potential protection in the U.S. potential because it's just a patent pending potential protection in the U.S. and in a lot of countries with some exceptions. And so start calling the second you file your provisional. And usually in three or four months, it has legs. Maybe things drag in the six months, eight months. But you, if you're using the event right approach and you're really reaching out, you're going to get it all done in a year. And you're going to know if there's somebody in France, company in France, and they might be like, oh, we don't care about patents, monsieur. You know, we don't care. <laughs> and, and, and But then another company is like, oh, no, and they're in Italy. And they're like, no, that's really important to us. And you're like, well, we have the right to do that because I filed my U.S. provisional. And, and so – it puts people at ease because it's, it's nice to be able to think big when you're licensing. I could license in all these countries, and yes, you can. More than likely, you're licensed in the U.S. or Canada, and then some people license in Europe, but you're yeah. probably not going to license in some of these 
uh, yeah. third world countries. There's not a lot of respect for intellectual property. It's probably highly unlikely. But if they're part of the PCT, you're leaving that option. It gives you the warm and fuzzies to move forward going, hey, if I get those deals on the table and I get companies from those countries, I could do a deal with them and file a patent. Yeah. You know? and, I think, and I think what you said, Andrew, it all starts with the filing of the U.S. PPA, right? And that yeah. holds open the door then, especially if you do eventually convert over and file a PCT application, it holds the door open to potential filings in 154 countries. And, and you're right. Depending on your licensee, that may be of of importance to them. But it may not. Uh, but it may. But it may. Not, <laughs> you know. So I think there's a business decision to be made, right? And and you have to ask yourself, you know, realistically, where am I going to be selling these goods, or where do I expect they that they will be sold? Um, you know, one other comment that I think you had made a, a few moments ago um, about about provisional uh, patent applications too. Um, not only do they do they uh, ultimately uh, serve as this sort of flag and, and give you this earliest filing date and give you the option long term of, of making foreign filings? But again, you do get that one year within which to to start your U.S. examination as well. And there are certain, you know, since we're talking about foreign filings, there are certain other treaties. You know, we talked about the Paris Convention. We've talked about the PCT application. Mm -hmm. There are also what are called patent prosecution highway agreements between the United States Patent Office and patent offices of, other, of certain other countries. Mm -hmm. And so if you get your U.S. application um, 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 allowed or, or, or in very good form, that actually may grease the skits, so to speak, at foreign mm -hmm. patent offices through these PPH, Patent Prosecution Highway Agreements, and help to keep the cost down. So nice. there is, there's, there's, some, there's all sorts of interactions and, and nuances to the foreign patent filing process. Important thing for your listeners to know, it all begins with that provisional application yeah. at the outset. And I wasn't comfortable talking about this until I had you on because I talked to our students about it, but I didn't want to go on our YouTube show and talk about it unless I had all, all the facts. So it's, it's, it is a, a viable to spend 75 bucks on a provisional patent and potentially have a patent in other countries later if you get interest from companies Absolutely. in those countries. And that is just tremendously um, empowering. I think for inventors on a budget, I really is. Ab and absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. All right. So thanks again, Jake. Um, thank you so, so much. And I want to remind everybody to take care, keep inventing, and we'll catch up with you next time. See you guys. Mm -hmm.